Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to yet another exciting episode of the Vinnie Eastwood Show, broadcasting live on AmericanFreedomRadio.com four days a week for your listening discomfort. Because we, you know, let's let's face facts here. Everybody's like trying to get to escapism and some form of entertainment to make themselves feel better, to distract themselves from their real problems and that kind of thing. People who listen to this show, on the other hand... They don't necessarily want to be distracted from problems. They actually want to hear and understand them so that they might, in some way, be able to solve them. That's the thing, ladies and gentlemen. You've got to listen. You've got to listen for a long time before you can comprehend something. Only once you comprehend a problem can you start hatching schemes to solve them that might actually work whole bunch of people go, hey, well, just don't tell us about the problems, just tell us the solutions. If I told you the solutions and you didn't even understand the problem, what kind of solution could you implement that would work? None is the answer. My very special guest joining me today uh, from itccs.com is, oh wait, dot org, sorry, is Kevin Annett. And we're going to be talking about the Catholic Church and murders and cover-ups and all that good stuff. Kevin, welcome to the program. Thanks, Randy. It's been a while. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it has been a, a, a while, and I've been getting into that mode uh, usually toward the end of years where I think about people that I've had on the show that were really awesome that I haven't t- talked to in a, in a long time in the sort of holiday spirit, Christmas cheer sense of the word. Welcome to the Vinnie Eastwood Show. Thank you. Now, please, uh, since we last spoke, many things have transpired, I'm sure, and I'd like to be briefed, as it were. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I think one of the big things, at least in the last few months, is on June 3rd uh, this year, there was a big article in the New York Times, it was actually on the front page, where they stated that the Canadian government finally admitted that yes, genocide did occur in their Indian schools. And they quoted a figure of thousands of children who died. Um, now, you know, this is, of course, is something we've been working for for many years to force this, this disclosure. And what I find mind boggling, Vinny, is how a government can admit, oh, yes, genocide occurred under our auspices and the churches, but nobody's ever gone to jail for it. And they just kind of pass it off, and the, the New York Times reports it, and then they move on to the next story. And, uh, you know, it's just, I think, an example of how, in reality, these crimes are never considered crimes, um, you know, in practice. So, I mean, for me, it was gratifying after 20 years' work to have that. And yet, you know, it, it also shows, that, you know, just how decadent the whole situation is. I've, I've actually been uh, talking with somebody that, that, uh, that got really badly assaulted by some uh, soldiers recently, and it's the same thing. They they come up and say, "Oh, we're really sorry that we brutally beat you and everything like that," uh, but we're not going to issue a public press statement, or, or and uh, we co- definitely don't want you to go to the media. And uh, are, are you going to punish any of the people that uh, beat me? Up? Well, no. Somebody took full responsibility for it and everything, and we're we're working it out internally. See, that's the kind of thing. It's it's like um, is the word placating? Mm-hmm. Well, you know, it's even gotten so bad. I think the mask has slipped so much on the system that they don't even worry about accountability anymore. They, um, it, it's, an, it's openly criminal activity that governments and corporations and churches do all the time, but um, it, it, they know they're above the law. There isn't any rule of law anymore, as we know. It's, it's just kind of gone out the window. And so... Uh, I think it, it's kind of like a, uh, I found in my own life, There's you reach a crossroads eventually and you realize, are we going to continue to try to prop up and expect justice for a system that is that is so, you know, impossible um, to be accountable and to, and to produce justice, or are we going to try to build something else? And to, I mean, in the common law courts we've been trying to set up and the other work we're doing, this is a lot of the focus that we're doing now getting people to take back their power and not look into the system anymore to give it to them. I Also, the 
the problematic difficulty is using the system to enforce its own laws upon itself and it's just like they didn't build it to do that okay no oversight accountability uh two things that you generally don't want if you're running a criminal organization that's stealing millions of dollars and killing thousands of people okay just just in a general kind of way well here's another one uh, there's a news item today it says um Vatican is operating brothels for priests in Rome. Um, according to the latest document leaked in the VataLeaks scandal, Vatican-owned properties near the Italian Parliament are being used as saunas and massage parlors where priests go to pay for sex. Um, two years ago, it emerged that the Vatican had purchased a uh, 23 million euro share of a Rome apartment block uh, on Via Carducci, which housed the Europa Multi Club. Uh, which is an international kind of uh, prostitution and sauna system. Um, Cardinal Tarsicio Bertone, who held the Vatican's purse strings until 2008, purchased this entire block of flats for priests to use for prostitution purposes. What's interesting about that is that Tarsicio Bertone is one of the, he was the Secretary of State under uh, Pope Benedict, Joseph Ratzinger, and both of them resigned after they had been named in our common law court case in 2013 as being involved in child trafficking. So it's interesting that he's, you know, his name is coming up again um, in the news in relation to this stuff. Well, scumbags are kind of like really buoyant feces. It doesn't matter how many times yeah. you try to flush them, they just keep popping up again. Yep, true enough. I think in the process, though, I think uh, I'm, I'm hoping that enough people wake up that we reach a kind of critical mass where the system doesn't operate anymore. And like I say, we can try to at least even in a local way, try to create something different. And I, I, I think people are awakening to that necessity now. I was thinking about a pun uh, to do with the, the concept of critical mass, because, of course, uh, when priests give sermons, it's called a mass, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. You can imagine having a, uh, a critical mass outside of uh, the Vatican or something of that nature <laughs> where somebody would preach about their crimes and scumbaggery. Right. Well, you know, one of the things that we are the work we're doing kind of in different countries is we encourage people to perform citizen arrests on priests who, who have harmed children and who have all, as they always do in 99% of the cases, get away with it. And the police look the other way. Um, so, you know, this, this is the kind of thing that people have got to be doing if they want to protect their own children. Well, I, I think a deeper realization, uh, dawns when the police look the other way. It means that they're on the take or at the very least, the people who are making the decisions about the investigations and the prosecutions are on the take. And on top of that, you must have some kind of bribery and corruption going on within the court system so that they allow this farce to continue with the amount of evidence that keeps mounting up day by day. Only a criminal organization that is taking a pay cut on behalf of the criminals would uh, do such a thing, in my opinion. Uh -huh. Well, it's... I've seen so many cases of that, um, you know, so many times, you know, 20 years ago when I began to, you know, document and work with victims of the, of the genocide in the Indian boarding schools in Canada, uh, we went to the police so many times with the evidence of, of children who had been harmed, of grave sites where they were buried. Universally, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police just refused to investigate, just like the FBI does in America. Um, where, you know, people down there have tried the same thing, and they continually protect, the, the, especially the Catholic Church. So, um, you know, it's one of the reasons, I think, that uh, this present Pope, who is doing a nice dog and pony show, trying to make everyone think the Church is different now, um, he was invited to speak to both houses of Congress. He got a standing ovation. I mean, you know, it's so when it's at that level, um, people are quite easily and to throw up their hands and say, well, what can you do, right, when there's that kind of collusion going on? Well, again, uh, this actually refers back to what you said earlier about the entire system needing to be brought down in order to bring any one of these uh, factions to justice, yes? Well, I think so. Because I mean, that's what we sh we, we've learned in practice in Canada. We, we tried for years to use the Canadian courts to prosecute, prosecute the government and the churches for these crimes, and we got the same answer all the time from the judges. They said, um, <clears throat> we cannot charge the Crown with genocide. It's ultra vires or beyond our jurisdictional competence. And I, you know, we eventually said, fine, then we have to go to another court. We have to either create our own court or try international courts. But unfortunately, 
no international court has the mandate to prosecute whole institutions for these crimes. So that's why we went the common law court route, and and at least at a you know at the level of of um, the psychological and moral impact of naming these people. Like I say, they resigned. A number of the people named in the cases have resigned. The whole big effort now by the Vatican to try to improve their public relations image, it's all been because of the stuff coming out, and they knew they had to respond. Well, these forcing responses is obviously, you know, one good thing, but it's never the full whole. Have you noticed, no matter how far you push them to the edge, trying to get them to fall off, preferably into some kind of prison cell for the rest of their life, no matter how hard you push, they just don't budge. They they can do admissions and, and things like that, but is there a precedent for a broad scale uh, child uh, trafficking and sex crime uh, murder slash network that's so intertied with the governments and uh, military industrial complexes of the world? Has there ever been a precedent for them wholesale being brought out into the sunlight and then being shoved into a dark hole? Well, no, not really. That's the problem. I mean, the the uh, the child trafficking and the you know sacrifice, ritual sacrificial killings of children, all these things that we're we're trying to document, um, especially based in Europe. It's you realize very quickly that um, it's so uh, lucrative. It's so well organized. I mean, they say human trafficking alone accounts for more than twenty million people every year in the world. And it's a huge industry, global industry. It's not a bunch of uh, nut bars e- exploiting children. It's a whole industry uh, bankrolled by some of the major banks in the world. We found, you know, for example, um, J.P. Morgan and HSBC Bank in America were actually fined several billion dollars each for laundering money of the Mexican drug cartels. And when you when there's drug laundering going on, there's also uh, human trafficking. I mean, it's all connected. And so these these are these these are multinational businesses, and we know all, you know the Catholic Church's involvement is well documented, but it reaches into all levels of society. Um, and so it's it's like an, it, the tentacles reach everywhere, and that's why it's difficult to know where to begin in terms of trying to stop it. Well, there was a film called uh, Skin Trade, I believe, starring Dolph Lundgren, and uh, towards the end of the film, they uh, have a black panel just with a you know, statistic on it, uh, 20 to 30 million individuals are trafficked worldwide annually. An estimated 98% of sex trafficking victims are women and children. Yes, I mean, that's what we found as well. Um, a lot of the work, I mean, of course, I've been doing work in North America and in Western Europe primarily. And um, if people go to our website, itccs.org, there's several interviews on there with, with uh, a Dutch and a Belgian woman uh, Tost Nienhaus and uh, Anne-Marie van Billenberg, both of them um, were raised in these uh, satanic ritual networks uh, from uh, from childhood. And, I mean, they their accounts are, are chilling, but one of the things that they both said independently was the involvement of what's called Drangheta, or that's one of the names for the European Mafia, who are the biggest human traffickers and drug traffickers in Europe. And they get the police, who are often on their payroll, to provide not just children, but teenagers from youth detention centers that are used in things like these these human hunting parties that a lot of the elite get into, you know, literally tra- hunting down naked kids in the woods and killing them and cutting off their sex organs as trophies. I mean, this was described in detail by eyewitnesses who were there. And the problem is that you can't, for every honest cop who wants to investigate this, there's two or three others who are informing or looking the other way. And that's why it's up to the, the people themselves to take responsibility for, for stopping this. And that's where, frankly, we're finding the difficulty because, you know, people have been raised to always look to somebody else to do this thing. Uh, and it's a big step for a lot of people to realize, well, no, it's up to all of us. Well, it's it's problematic as well because many people retreat inwards when they see this threat that they're faced with and uh, the kind of monsters that they're up against. They they don't want to come out. They don't want to uh, talk and, and they don't want to go through the hassle and the problems. Somebody has to, um, and usually somebody does. 
What's problematic is that the amount of support that people can muster against such an organization is a fraction of the organization's power. Right. Well, I mean, it's, it, it's like anything new. It takes a long time it, to build. And the, what I'm finding the problem is with people is that um, it isn't even a question of a three-minute memory, which a lot of people are kind of being raised to have now with these things. But it's they have a three-minute endurance. Uh, they, they're looking for short, quick solutions. And, you know, it took us almost 20 years to force this the, the truth of genocide in Canada out um, through a lot of struggle. And these are, you know, long campaigns to, to, to achieve these things. And a lot of people are willing to, to put that time into it. The, the hard truth, though, is that if you don't, these things aren't, aren't brought out and, and changed. It's a sacrifice, basically, isn't it? Yeah, very much. Now, you know... What, what, did, what did your religion teach you about sacrifice for others, self-sacrifice for others, rather than sacrificing somebody for yourself? Well, it depends which part of it. Do you mean Christianity? Either um, either, or, either, or, bro, if, if uh, Christianity is not your religion anymore. <laughs> well, I mean, I was never a big C Christian in the first place. I never believed in organized religion even when I was a minister. But I, I think more at a, at a moral level, I think something born within all of us is that conscience... To, to not stand by when someone is being harmed, especially children. I mean, I know you'd have to be a sociopath not to have a, a human feeling when you know children are being harmed in your own neighborhood. But what's unfortunately stronger than that concern and love, you know, for the innocent is fear of something happening to us. And I think that those fears are, are wired into us at a young age. I think it's, you know, as you and others, I'm sure, have often talked about, the whole culture of slavery, mental slavery that's, that, that we're born into means the main question in our mind is what's going to happen to me if I do this rather than what's going to happen to that child if I don't, right? So we have to make that kind of shift. And people like, they're afraid, right? You, you get this kind of thing, afraid to speak out, afraid to challenge these people. Sometimes when somebody stands up to a real bad person in front of them, they, they stand up and they back you up, you know, that kind of thing. You've seen it happen. I've seen it happen. But what's it going to take for everybody to stand up against these kind of people, you know? Like, you'd be talking about the whole freaking world has to stand up here, Kevin. Right? Well, that's, that's actually yeah. what it's going to take. In order to topple any one of these corrupt institutions, they all have to be toppled. Well, you know, you can only really start where you are. And I think it's a lot of people are trying in their own way where they are. Um, you know, it's, um, you know, the old saying that came up in the 80s, um, it, it, think globally, act locally. Um, I've never totally agreed with that. I think we can't help but act locally wherever we are. But... I don't think it's really possible to think globally. Uh, that's one of the problems that we're thinking perhaps on too big a scale. We have to think based on our own experience, what we know is true for ourselves, and, and act based on that. Um, if you look at too, the enemy in too big a way, it gets overwhelming psychologically, and I think we have to realize that we have tremendous power if we exercise it. And I mean, you know, in the work I've been doing, I've been showing people that, that, you know, um, you know, me staying at this work for 20 years for certain things to happen. If you multiply that by 100 people, think of the impact we can have. It's just that people give up too soon. And they get demoralized too quickly. Is that I've been having this discussion again and again and again this whole week so far about what it takes to actually make people snap back, you know? Not what breaks them and makes them give up. But what pushes them too far so that they start pushing back? Well, often it's a personal loss. You, know, When you lose something or someone very close, when, when you've been traumatized, you can either snap and get crushed or get harder from it and, and stronger over the long run. And a lot of the people, you know, the veterans who I work with, who have hung in there over the years, they have gone through incredible loss and sacrifice. And they don't even want to talk about it anymore. It's too personally painful. But all of that has given them the resolve. 
it's almost like, okay, you've taken everything from me. What, what's, what more can you do to me? I'm not afraid of you guys anymore. You've taken it all. Um, I have nothing left to do but to fight. And, and Sun Tzu says that in The Art of War. Um, you know, that if you... He urges commanders to always put their soldiers in situations where they can't escape. Because then they have no option but to fight. That's why you never back an enemy totally into a corner. You just strengthen the resolve that way. Uh, you have to let them give them a way out if you want to win a battle. Um, it's the same way with any of us. We, when our backs are to the wall, that's when our resolve really comes out. So I don't really um, uh, think that repression and, and police states and that are a bad thing uh, in terms of the long thing. They, they create a counter-reaction which allows us to overthrow those systems. So, I mean, I think we have to take strength from our ad adversity. Maybe it's a delicate balance. Maybe there's such a big game being played that it's inherently very fragile. Something uh -huh. could just tip it over the edge. It, it might well, not be, know. it might not be just such an interconnected system as if uh, one falls and the rest come in to support it. It might be a delicate connection where one falls and the rest follow. Well, exactly, because and when you look in history, whenever you look at revolutions that happen, right up to the day that it happens, people are often saying, you know, this regime is going to be in power for the next thousand years, there's nothing we can do, and then bang, there's been this whole movement uh, off the radar screen, and people reach that critical mass, and... Um, it's like when you watch birds in the sky or fish in the ocean, you know how they all turn in unison at the same moment? Yeah. Uh, they're not watching each other and following, or there'd be a, a, a difference in the way they move. They all do it at once because there's a group mind operating, which, and it's the same with the human race. We reach a certain point, and then we all move at once. And we don't know what that thing is. I don't want to put a religious definition on it, but it's something higher than us, something, you know, there have been different names for it, um, but... That, that group mind, if you like, that higher consciousness does reach a point and then people's ideas everywhere change all at the same time. Um, we've seen that with a lot of different issues in the world. So I think we're reaching that same thing here. People are realizing that the, the, this corporatocracy that's running the world more and more um, is, has no more credibility and people are looking for alternatives now. I think what you're looking for... And the explanation is the survival instinct, because the reason why, well, actually, when they're just flying around, sure, same thing. However, herds, um, I believe the a herd of zebras, for example, they can detect a predator and move as one, no matter how big the herd is, so long as about 6% of the herd is aware that there's a predator. Suddenly they're all aware. It's the 100th monkey syndrome kind of thing yeah. uh when yeah. i i'm starting to believe that dna is a fractal antenna a uh, microtransmitter of some source and it can transmit and receive so if people are sending out particular vibes particular ideas or, so, or something like that just in their own thoughts and intentions there's a possibility that others can pick it up around them or even on the other side of the world like mm -hmm. uh who was it the guy who invented the telescope you know who that was uh galileo no nah, it was actually okay. invented by like nine different guys oh, on, right, yeah, on, on sure. different sides of the world who never yeah, met yeah. each other <laughs> on the same night Right? Mm. That, that's who invented the telescope. <laughs> and mm. I, that's the kind of um, stuff that I'm talking about here. And I, and I believe that's the reason why I keep doing what I'm doing, uh, regardless of the consequence, regardless of what, you know, uh, logical, plausible chance of victory is. You just have to keep doing it. Because if you mm -hmm. don't keep sending out all that signals in the airwaves the chance of the herd waking up and recognizing the predator in their midst and running for cover and huddling together for protection has a less chance of happening. Mm -hmm. Well, and that was, you know, in traditional cultures, that's often the, the role of the shaman to, to make those journeys and to acquire that awareness and bring it back, you know, to the people. Uh, the problem in our culture is that we have no shaman. Uh, the the so-called experts, you know, scientific or 
other experts. Um, they're looking at scales of the dragon. They don't know. They've been taught in the in the uh, tradition of of you know empirical knowledge, where you just look at different phenomena in isolation from one another, and they don't look in terms of entire systems and we have no wise men or women to point us to these things. We 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 really have to rely on ourselves in many ways. Well, yeah. Ultimately, I think uh, even in the human body, if a cell is unhealthy, it dies. But the body continue. But the body continues on. So it's in that cell's own self-interest to remain healthy, isn't it? Mm -hmm. I mean, other, otherwise it can't contribute to the whole. Otherwise, it can't survive. And I think um, getting through this sort of trauma, people say, oh, I've got nothing left to lose. They haven't thought about it very deeply. There's a lot of things you can lose. You can lose your life. You can lose your sanity. You can lose your compassion. You can lose the will uh, to do good. Yeah, I see that all the time. Yeah. Yeah, right. So another thing about not only how do you activate people and with that loss, but once they've been activated, how do you prevent them from being deactivated by the inevitable pain, trauma, stress, and anxiety and isolation that they're going to feel? Well, you always have to be giving people examples. Um, you know, even the most aware ones among us have been raised from a young age to live vicariously, that you look, you live through some other figure, authority figure. Um, in a lot of the work we do, people are always looking for the experts to tell them, to give them the explanation, to, to break the ice. Um, so it's really hard to know. It's like a thin edge or a thin line you're walking between doing that. If you do that too much for people, they learn to rely on, on you and depend on you and not themselves. And it's that training now of the people who are able, and I think it's a small percentage frankly you know five or percent or less of people who are actually willing to be self-activating and play that that leadership for themselves and not look to others all the time i yeah it just requires mentorship in order to have that realization though generally mm. I've, i found if your uh, your friends family or associates etc are very independent people i mean it's not like it's not entirely dissimilar from that whole principle that you are what you eat. You are who you hang around with. And if you're around people that amaze you and inspire you, don't be surprised that you become an amazing, inspiring person. Mm -hmm. And that's why, again, you know, it's um, good to listen, especially to people who've gone through a lot. Because you might actually catch something that's worthy of note to you personally you ever know anybody like that you know they were just talking in general but you found it was so deeply personal the realization you just had oh yeah all the time i think we all have those those people in our lives but uh how do you maintain those relationships with those people in your life when you change so much as a result of the work that you're now doing well, I don't know if you always do. I think, in fact, um, you know, there's the old saying, you can't go home again once your eyes have been opened. It's true that, that um, you know, that I'm, I'm finding this with, with some of the people who have been in this work, like me, for, for decades. And um, none of the people we associate with now are from our past because we can't really speak to people anymore anymore. Um, who are stuck in that old paradigm and in the old compromises. Um, and there's, in fact, fewer and fewer people we can speak to, you know, uh, those who understand, because each of us has a history that can't, we can't teach it to somebody else. People can only go through these things themselves and learn them for their own experiences. So, um, you know, when you're on the point of a spear is what I'm saying. It's thin. It's, it's, there's very few of you who are doing a lot of this, work and I'm I'm kind of not worried anymore about reaching a lot of people I think that that sorts itself out I think you have to bear witness in your own way and then things follow I, I think marketing executives might disagree with you yeah well we have different priorities <laughs> <laughs> well, 
you know, I've actually been coming to that quagmire myself recently, you know, like, how much effort do you want to put into your real actual work that's there to change the world just for the sake of changing the world for the better? And mm. how much effort do you want to do into monetizing that so that you can live a luxurious, comfortable, well-financed, uh, extra productive lifestyle? And uh, again, I'm stuck in this quagmire, I don't know. I, I think that maybe when you shift your priorities like that, you lose sight of what you got into it in the first place for. Mm. That's what I'm concerned about. Mm-hmm. We can all be corrupted, can't we? If we let go of ourselves, yeah. yeah. I think uh, that, that's the key, not to let go of yourself. What do you mean? Like, hold on to yourself. I had this conversation with my friends last night. And I said to them, I'm really concerned about my thoughts, right? And I try to do almost the opposite of what my thoughts tell me to do at any given moment, like on a constant basis. My thoughts tell me to take advantage of people, to treat others in a, in a different way than they should, to be selfish, you know? But... Uh-huh. I stop myself from doing that because I know that it's wrong. And uh, they just said, well, bro, <laughs> that's both of us as well. <laughs> you know? isn't, that, isn't that like what being a good person is, is about recognizing the evil inside of you and denying it uh, to have its day in the sun? Okay, yeah, I mean, that's one school of thought. I mean, another is, you know, we, we've, we often make a, um, this false dichotomy between the, the light and darkness in us. You know, you hear this, this expression a lot these days, light workers. Um, and it's funny because my ancestors in Ireland, they always believed that darkness was actually the symbol of goodness and, and, and deity and divinity. Like, the, you know, it's in, it's, it's in the underworld, um, the dark world where creativity, like in a womb, creativity and birth comes from. So dark and light aren't counterposed in that system. You know, we've got the yin and yang as opposed to the, the, the Judeo-Christian tradition that says there's bad in us and we have to fight it and we can only be good. I mean, that's not realistic. We all have that shadow. We all have to come to terms with it um, through honesty. But I, I think that what we're talking about is on a different level. Though. We're, we're not talking about necessarily changing people. Um, what, the work I'm doing now, as, as I've been doing all along, has been looking at those systems that are responsible for how people come out, if you know what I mean. And saying, like, for example, the case of genocide. Genocide didn't happen because of a bunch of bad priests running around. That was part of it. It's because of a whole mindset and strategy that said, we've got to wipe out these people to get their land, and because we're superior to them. That's, that's a systemic problem, not an individual one, if you know what I mean. Well, shamans and uh, traditional uh, uh, spirit quests and tripping on uh, cactus and things like that. Catholic Church basically through the Spaniards just came in and wiped all that out, isn't it? They they just well, there's, ex- there's, they, they exterminated that piece, of, that piece of culture, and they're still and they're still doing it. See, they haven't even quite finished their job, you know. And and um, you know, I like the whole thing about the light workers. You know, it's just. <laughs> It almost makes me laugh to kind of, kind of um, see the um, the ability to see things in just two dimensions like that, black mm-hmm. and white, you know, as if the whole world isn't just several shades of grey. And um, it reminds me of a yeah. joke, actually. Two ascended masters were uh, sitting around a fire. One of them starts telling a joke, and he says, uh, how many ascended masters does it take to change a light bulb? The other one answers him, I don't know, that's the light worker's job. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's uh, it, it's kind of you know I think that that way of looking at the world that you know we ca- ca- have to be in light all the time and there's and, and darkness is bad. I mean it's it's a fear based way of thinking, and it prevents us from embracing our own our own shadow and darkness. And I mean, you know, with some people like an I don't know psychopath, it you can't reach them. Um, and there's no point trying to. And when a whole society has become psychopathic, there's no point expecting justice from it. 
Um, but most people aren't in that boat, and you can, you know, you can work with them. But I don't know. Well, see, it's it's also a difficult thing to uh, to talk about because often when you think about why you start doing what you're doing and how you keep yourself together, the realization hits you that you're only just managing to keep yourself together, or at least that's how it is for me. I feel like I'm on a, uh, a razor's edge some days mm-hmm. with my sanity, with my emotions, just knowing what I know and talking to the people I talk to, um, does scare me. And it makes me feel bad. It makes me feel guilty for some reason. Like I'm not doing enough. Like mm. like I don't deserve to just, you know, take take the rest of the day off after the show or something like that. Like I have to keep working. You weren't raised in a Catholic family by any chance, were you? <laughs> Indeedy, actually. Yeah, well, there you go. I mean, it's, it's all shame-based. It's a shame-based religion. Um... So, can you expand on that? What is a shame-based religion? How do they teach it to you, and what's the actual effect on the behavior? Well, I mean, first of all, it's based in violence, um, and it doesn't have to be physical violence. It can be the violation of a child's natural instincts, it's saying, "Look, you're born damned. You're born with something we call original sin, like in Catholicism. You're all born damned, and only if you're a good person are you are you not going to go to hell." So. You, you, you're not allow, you don't allow children to trust their own feelings. Um, and you're, it, it's, I meet so many people like this who were raised Catholic, but it isn't, not, it isn't just Catholicism that does this. I mean, many religions do this. Because, you know, don't forget, religion comes from a word meaning, religio means to bind together. And to me, that isn't an act of heaven, that's an act of human beings trying to control other human beings. You bind everybody together into one way of thinking, one way of behaving, and you're going to die if you don't. I mean, um, we're, not, we're not born in a state of shame. That's taught to us. We're born in a state of natural grace, you know, and beauty. Each one of us, each soul born is born that way. But there's this, um, it, it's more than brainwashing. It's at a very deep level, um, you know, to try to break from this is a hard thing for a lot of people. What, you, you broke from it? Can I break from it? Because, you know, I, I, re- I really don't like feeling guilty, bro. I really don't like feeling guilty when I actually haven't even done anything wrong. I really don't like it. And I've been wondering why I've been feeling like that. And you've just explained it to me. You know what it was? My mother. All right? She said, and we didn't want to go to church, but every time we did go, we get an ice cream. It was the only reason I went. <laughs> There you go. True confessions. Yeah. And so now I've got this, um, and now I've got some psychological uh, residual consequence from this. Uh, and I'm previously unaware of why, why that was. Well, think of the impact. Okay, you're a little kid sitting there in church. You look up, and there's this guy on the wall who's stretched on a cross, and the blood's coming out of him, and he's in agony, and he's got nails driven through his body. I mean, what the hell does that have to do with the message of Jesus? It, it, it's... it's um, traumatizing kids. Now, when you traumatize somebody at a young enough age, they cannot even raise their mind against authority, let alone their hand. They are in a permanent state of trauma, and that's the purpose of these images. Yeah. Uh, that actually sounds about right as well. I don't think I've ever actually taken on almost anybody in authority before. Always kind of like... Um at best, I sort of like dodge them and cut to the side and maybe charm them or something like that. But I right. very, very rarely direct opposition. Well, you know, look, Benny, at the hand gestures that any pope or politician always make. You know, the raised hand? Yeah. It, it's, it's more of that programming because um, the raised hand is not a wave of blessing or gesture. It's also a, hand, a, a gesture of, I'm going to hit you if you're bad. It's the raised hand of the parent. You look at a picture of the Pope and at a subconscious level, you're thinking, oh, I better go along with what he says and believe what he says, otherwise I'm going to get hit by God, right? As if he somehow represents God, which is nonsense, right? Now, here's the thing. Did the Catholic Church or the uh, main forms of like Roman Catholicism and the Vatican and Rome itself 
ever actually represent true, you know, uh, teachings of Jesus and, and actual Catholicism? Or has it always been a front to traumatize and control people? Well, I believe that it's always been that way. And uh, because the Roman Catholic Church is not, uh, as they claim, the direct descendant of Jesus Christ. On the contrary, they're the direct descendant of the uh, Emperor Constantine and Aurelia, who in the years, in the early part of the 4th century, created the corporation called the Roman Catholic Church. Before that, there were bishops of Rome, bishops of Constantinople, Alexandria. The church was scattered all over the place. But the Catholic Church, as we know, became the corporation that inherited the Roman Empire. They are the, they, even the, the, the words that the Pope uses to describe himself, Pontifex Maximus, the great bridge between heaven and earth, that's what the Roman Emperor called himself. It's just the empire with a new face. And, you know, so from the ver very beginning, it was really a counter-revolution against Christianity. And, um, you know, it, 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 popes believe that they are the bridge, but Christ is not the bridge between man and God. The Pope is. That's Catholic teaching. So that has nothing to do with, you know, what's in the Bible that I've read. <laughs> so it's a butchered uh, kind of misused thing. Because I actually said this on air. I'll, I'll, I'll try and uh, find it for us in a, in a second. Because this whole religious aspect has been coming up uh, quite a lot. And uh, people are, you know abandoning uh religious belief uh at the realization that there's you know something really wrong with mm -hmm. uh what it's doing to people you know and now am here it is am i the only one getting really sick of people who think that being religious is a sufficient substitute for thinking you know huh. now i'm not ragging on all religious people here just the ones who abandon all facts Reason, logic, and compassion in favor of the cultish preaching of hate towards everyone who doesn't share their faith. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not the only one, am I? You know? No, as a matter of fact, th those words could be written uh, by my ancestor Peter Annett, who was a uh, free thinking philosopher in London, England, and in 1769 he was thrown in prison on a charge of uh, blasphemous libel because he challenged things written in the Old Testament. He challenged the miracles and said, you know, it conflicts with reason. And since God gave us reason, how can this be true? And, um, you know, it, it's just common sense. I mean, that, that whether it's common law um, or, or anything, it, these things spring from us naturally. We have our own understanding of what justice and um you know, spirituality and all that is all about. And we, we need to trust that in ourselves and not look, you know, who said the kingdom of heaven is within you? He didn't, Jesus didn't say it was in the church. He said it's within you. The kingdom of heaven is within the Vatican walls and only there. And, and there's only <laughs> one, it's only one guy who can communicate with you. Okay. <laughs> and you got to pay him. You yeah. got to pay him lots of money. Did, did Jesus prophesy, he says, in the future, one day, <laughs> and the date will be changed to A.D. when I die. And <laughs> there'll be these dudes who bullshit everybody with a whole bunch of religious codswallop that they made up off the top of their head and wave their hands as if they're about to slap you around like a small child, and then they're going to pass a collection plate, which they will use to purchase small children. Well, that's why I like the um, Monty Python did a skip once. Um, and Michael Palin was dressed up like this guy called Vice Pope Eric, and he was a gangster with a bishop's outfit on, and he's talking to all of his fellow bishops, and he's saying, okay, boys, if we're going to worship a poor man like Jesus, we're going to need a rich institution to do it with. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's funny you should say that, because I've been thinking a lot about Monty Python just recently, and I watched a film in which they starred last night with, uh, with my mate Brenton, and uh, it was the, the the Monty Python guys all as these really weird-looking aliens who give this guy uh, uh, the power to do anything he can imagine, right? Just to test Earth as a species, because if he misuses all his all his uh, limitless power, then they're going to destroy the planet. And uh, I found it to be one of those really like interesting little morality tales. It was also quite funny. 
because it, it just occurs to me now that the planet is basically going, undergoing the exact same test, isn't it? A whole bunch of people on this planet have virtually unlimited power, and because they're misusing it, the planet is being destroyed. Yeah. Well, it, do you ever watch George Carlin when he was alive? The comedian, American comedian George Carlin. Of course. Yeah, yeah. Well, he did that great one called um, "Saving the Planet." Have you? <laughs> The planet's un the planet's undergone tsunamis and tornadoes and volcanic right. eruptions and comets and asteroids and solar flares yeah. and solar winds and uh, but do you think some plastic bags are gonna make a difference? <laughs> yeah, the planet's fine. We're going away. <laughs> it's the human race that has the problem, not the planet. She'll shake us off like a bad case of fleas. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do love the um, the fact that comedy is capable of doing something that politics cannot. Absolutely. Simpl simplify an equation, right? The two, the two right. people with the highest IQs in terms of job description are theoretical physicists and comedians. I theorize for the same reason. Their brains are attuned to looking at large sets of of complex information being able to interpret that information in all its hugeness and be able to condense it into a form that is comprehensible to somebody who's never even thought about the information before right well it's that's why we have to rely so much on comedy and also music because they're appealing to different parts of the brain you know the rational brain can be controlled by fear very easily but I noticed this the first time when I was a minister and I used to go into old folks' homes, care homes, and do, you know, church services there for the... And a lot of these older folks are in wheelchairs. They had had strokes. They couldn't speak, but they could sing. It was so amazing to watch. They couldn't utter a word, but you, you start playing the old hymns and they were singing away because that part of the brain, it wasn't coming from the speech center. It was coming from a different part, I think an older part of the brain. There was that theory that... Um, our ancestors a long time ago sang before they could speak. And that's a different part of our brain at work, just like when you're laughing, suddenly fear goes out the window. Those are our strengths. We've got to rely on more. Well, just thinking about a parrot or a cockatiel or, some, or something like that, they can sing before they can talk. Talking takes yeah. a lot of practice and stuff like that, but they can just sing naturally. Mm -hmm. And uh, maybe, maybe it's like old tribal ways of doing things that have been annihilated by the church are actually the way to do things. Could we do that? You know, wouldn't, wouldn't, a, wouldn't a globalized uh, society that is completely isolationist, like everybody's in their own, own, own little uh, sections and, and, and things like that, there's uh, uh, great family units and, and great community involvement and stuff like that, the cities have basically been abandoned and there's just small hamlets absolutely everywhere. And people mm. living together, uh, shamans and, villi and village heads and, and things like that, like a um, sort of like a neo something something. <laughs> I don't know what you'd call it. I mean, and I'm not saying this is a good idea, you know, we should abandon civilization and uh, build an entirely uh, different one with a whole new characteristics. I don't even know if that would be possible. I'm just wondering what would the result be if society was based not upon mass participation in a vicarious manner with media and living in uh, condensed areas where it was minute uh, communication between individuals and that nobody was ever really alone and everybody's got family and friends. I think it was um, Chief Sitting Bull, he said, when the white man came, our society was very simple. The women would raise the children and cook the meals and the men would go out fishing all day. And then they'd come back, make love to the women all night, and then go to sleep and get up early and do it all again. Only the white man is stupid enough to think he can improve on this. Mm. Yeah, well, 
I, I, you know, people are naturally gravitating back towards that. I mean, it's the only way we're going to survive the, this, glo this global corporatocracy that's, that's atomizing everybody and turning them into components of one big machine. You know, and so some, some devolution like that has to occur if we're going to survive, you know. Well, so is it a matter of survival to uh, destroy our current notion of civilization because of the realization that it's not fucking civilized, is it? No. It's, it's one big machine that's eating the planet. It's almost like um, a, a huge vacuum that's sucking all the life out of this planet, and we're all serving the machine because everybody, no one can see an alternative, and they're afraid of losing their little bit of piece of the pie. Well, the whole pie is going to be lost, people, the more you, you're involved in it. And I think that's – people are awakening to that now, but they don't want – they don't know, know what to do about it because they don't know what else to join. There isn't an alternative for them to join. And that they're kind of stuck in that limbo state. People are simply not aware that there's an alternative because the alternatives that are out there aren't financed by the massive, mega, ruthless, fascist corporations and scumbaggery that rule the planet. All right? It's just that simple. You won't, you won't see, uh, you know, great change being promoted on the news, will you? Encouraging everybody no, to never. join up to this organization that it's ex that's exposing a whole, a whole group of uh, pedophile scum, or, you know? No, they'll never, and you wouldn't want them to anyway, because they just twisted to their own purposes. And like I say, I mean, it's like um, people are doing these changes. You just can't see them, which is good. I mean, I think the more they're off the radar screen doing this stuff, the better. Mm. I don't know. I've got a philosophy. You know how they say if a uh, if a man speaks his mind in a forest and no woman hears him, is he still wrong? Well, I think if some scumbaggery gets exposed in a forest, but the guy who filmed it didn't upload the video, did that scumbaggery really get exposed? <laughs> interesting question <laughs> well see this is the reason why I have people like you on the show Kevin because if you go out there and you do all of these things and then nobody's there to help you publicize it mm -hmm. it's almost like you didn't do it at all to a degree or at least it doesn't have as great an effect and I think every radio show host has an obligation um, to do precisely that to mm -hmm. um lend their their power and audience to causes and people that are worthy that have proven themselves well i wish more media people thought your way well my mates um i had a conversation with them uh last night about this actually and uh the problem with being in the media is that it is a it's a breeding ground for psychopathic narcissistic scum, all right. I don't know. I don't know any way um, uh, better to say it, because I know that I'm a narcissist. I'm an inherently selfish person, um, but I, again, as I mentioned earlier, basically try to deny my instincts all the time. So when I'm in trouble or when I need help or something, uh, I always cry out for it because I want attention. But when people like you or uh, activists and things that I know really need help, they don't really ask for it, okay? And that's why I obligate myself to go in and just give it to them when they need it, right? Hence, kind of balancing this conflict that I have within. Now, I'm not a psychopath, Right? I'm a very selfish person, but I'm not a psychopath. And unfortunately, a lot of the people in the media are. If you have any institution, any kind of yep. job placement where people are <clears throat> getting paid, getting fame, getting power, getting influence, getting to rub shoulders with other interesting and powerful people, it's... <sighs> It's like moths to a flame. They just come pouring through. And I believe right. that's why the media has become so corrupted and uh, people like you are not heard as much as they should be. We'll be right back, ladies and gentlemen, after the break at com. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to our number two of the fastest two hours of talk radio. It's the Vinnie Eastwood Show, the lighter side of genocide, 
Just because we're being exterminated doesn't mean we can't make it fun. Otherwise, what's the point of being killed? And my very special guest from itccs.org is Kevin Annett, a uh, former priest <coughs> and uh, exposer of uh, priest-like scumbaggery, I guess. Welcome back. Thank you. That's a good way to put it. Yeah. You can put the little plaque on your uh, on your desk or something like that. Kevin Annett, exposer of priest-like scumbaggery. You could put it on my headstone, too. <laughs> well, there you go. There's a, there's a rosy thought for you. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, or I think you should do it past tense when it's on the headstone. Exposed priest-like scumbaggery. Speaking of which, let's think about the uh, the actual cases themselves. When you're taking these people to court, how how tight does your evidence have to be? Because I've I've seen so many of my friends who are activists and the, uh, the the wads of documentation and all of the stuff that you need to do because despite the fact that the authorities won't even effing enforce the law and in, 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 in many cases even look at the evidence you have to get it done in such a precise manner otherwise they throw it off they throw it out instantaneously without even not looking at it without even not enforcing the law you know well, the thing that first thing to understand is it's not based on evidence because they they will throw it out anyway, no matter how well you prove in your case. I mean, we prove beyond a shadow of a doubt uh, so far that they even admitted it eventually. Like I mentioned early on the show, that the New York Times reported this this year. Canadian government admitted that thousands of children died. Okay, well, we were saying that twenty years ago. They they knew they died. They killed them. They and the churches. So. But it isn't so much evidence, um, because don't forget, you don't need a lot of evidence um, in, in a lot of these cases. Um, you have people who see a crime, you have documents saying, yes, the crime happened the way they saw these people um, get killed, etc. So that would show to any reasonable jury or anything that, yes, these people are guilty. But even even though we know they're guilty, they still get off because they are the ones still in charge. That's the issue. It's the issue of power, not evidence. Also, evidence doesn't convince people who don't want to hear it. You know, um, People are not going to give up their privileges and say, oh yeah, it's true, we took all this land from the Aboriginals, let's hand it back. That's not going to happen, so they have to warp the law to serve their own vested interests. That's the issue. It's about power, it's not about evidence. Yeah, I've actually come to the um, the same uh, recollection. Like I did some uh, work for the Fluoride Action Network, and uh, they were meticulous. You know, they're, they're making sure to cross the T's and dot all the I's. They had to do does uh, like a dozen re-edits or so, or something like that. It um, it actually gave me acid reflux for the first time in my life because of the amount of anxiety doing all doing all that nitpicking <laughs> actually caused me, right? right. And um, the reason why they did all this is completely understandable, because if you don't, if you get one thing even slightly wrong, they'll launch out at you, right? Or at least that's what they told me, and I was willing to oblige them, even though my personal belief is that it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how right you are, how wrong you are, how, what what you know uh, inaccuracies or, or or anything that you've got in in your case. Okay? They don't matter. They'll just demonize you and ignore you anyway. Exactly. Right? So what the hell is the point in stressing out over stuff that in the end of the matter doesn't even matter anyway? Well, exactly. And, and not only that, Benny, but the, we have to ask ourselves, why do people keep putting themselves through that? Where, and I often ask this with a lot of the Aboriginal people I worked with in Canada. Why do people keep going into the white courts? You know, they're not going to find themselves guilty for trying to wipe out your people, and who they're still trying to wipe you out all the time. And so why do you have to convince them all the time? Because it, it's an infantile way of thinking. People say, well, we've got to get the parental figure to say, yeah, we're good little boys and girls, and they're not going to hurt us anymore, and pat us on the head and say, your case is just, and then it'll be just. You know, when people say, well, is your court, common law court legitimate? I say, well, what do you mean by legitimate? Do you mean do the authorities recognize it? No. They're criminal authorities. Why would they recognize it? 
Um, but people can't think and act for themselves. They're always looking to the father figure to bring them injustice. And that's the problem. You don't have that among the African-American community, though. I found that very interesting. There's an old saying, you don't have to convince African-Americans that there's a conspiracy against them. They know. Oh, well, yeah, I mean, slavery will do that to you. But, I mean, it, it can also turn you into, like, this is a frustrating thing I find working with a lot of Aboriginal people in that, um, the, you know, the, the vast majority of them are still so traumatized that they can't think as anything but slaves. And the people I work with out of the really thousands I've interviewed and worked with over the decades, I, would, I could count on two hands the number who are genuinely indigenous in the sense of holding on to their traditional spirit and values and standing outside the system. You know, the, the rest are truly aboriginal, which means not original. You know, like abnormal, aboriginal means not of the original group. There's something else. I spoke with a woman from uh, who was an aboriginal leader in Australia, and she called those people coconuts. They're brown on yeah. the outside, but they're white on the inside. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, as a little kid in one of these residential schools, and you had them all over Australia too, um, you either conform or die. Um, you know, you... <laughs> you'd get gang raped or tortured or killed unless you went along. And so, you know, the whole Stockholm syndrome syndrome where you identify and take on the attitudes of your oppressor and your rapist. I mean, that's common. Well, cause you start to identify with them. It's yeah. The old Stockholm yeah. syndrome, isn't it? Yeah. And, and it's, it's very widespread all through the culture. It isn't just a beaten Aboriginal person. Everybody suffers from that, frankly, vast majority of us. Well, e even those of us um, who listen to talk radio shows like this are still suffering that kind of residual effect. I know, I do. You know, yeah. All those past, yeah, tra all those past traumas I've I've had, they're uh, they're still with me. They prevent me from doing things on a day to day basis because I can't yeah. do them because I'm too afraid. We got to examine ourselves. Unless you do that hard personal work, you you can't really do this work in the inner world, because um, you know we are to some degree our own worst enemy when it comes to confronting authority right well that's because um i think usually the people who confront authority are forced into the position where they become the authority and then they become corrupted and get overthrown by the next one i feel uh, there needs to be something to be done to break that chain can't we go from one authority that doesn't misuse its power doesn't even exercise any power, doesn't even need to, you know? Well, I'm, I'm an anarchist. I don't believe in authority except the, that the authority of your own conscience and people have to be governed by that. That's kind um, of what I mean. Yeah, we, 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 we have to stop handing our authority over, whether it's by voting, by paying taxes, by cooperating under their laws, and take back... The Mohawks in Canada call it reclamation. You know, they, they reclaim their land. They, they realize... Uh, somebody once told me there that... In the Mohawk territory, you can't reclaim your land till you reclaim your own spirit and mind first, and we all need to do that. Well, if you're not strong enough, how would you successfully yep. get your land back? Well, you don't. You become, and that's the problem with most of the native politicians and so-called leaders, is that um, they're still slaves in their own minds, so they can be very easily manipulated by the government, which they are all the time. We've identified on the show one time uh, that. One of the biggest problems with uh, people growing up, achieving adulthood, is that there are no rites of passage, right? For example, in New Zealand, uh, your rite of passage is on your 21st birthday. And in order to prove that you're you know, now an adult and you've got you know, your own power and your strength and that kind of thing, uh, and you know yourself deep within, you have to drink a large quantity of beer in something called a yard glass. <laughs> all right so so you know like yeah, now you're a now you're an upstanding <laughs> you're an adult now is really that's the benchmark bro i don't have to yep. know myself very well i mean i just need to be able to control my gag reflex i mean it, come on really so you, you don't do uh you don't do walkabouts out in the back in the uh in the outback eh? you don't go out there and find your animal guide or no, you just, yeah. 
I mean, well, you, see, you see, and again, and again, if, you, if you've been talking to Ab- Aboriginal people, do they have rites of passage? What do they do in order to get their soul from that of a child to become that of a powerful adult? I can't tell you. I don't know. Not from that culture. Yeah. But, uh, you know, from the remnants of what used to be in my culture, you don't get it anymore. But um, for one thing, there were much better role models than we have now. I mean, people were, I looked at a history in my own family and um, 200 years ago, my ancestors in, in, who had emigrated to, from Ireland and England to Canada, I was looking at these people. They all lived into their 90s. They were all farmers, blacksmiths. They, they were carpenters. They made their own clothes. They were totally self-reliant. Now, I can't imagine if you put me in those situations. I couldn't do any of that. I mean, it, it's, um, it's a different time, right? Well, it was a different time, but I was just thinking I saw this meme on Facebook this one time, Kevin. It said uh, when people went through the Depression... They knew how to mend their own clothes, their shoes, make their own clothes, grow their own food, you know? They knew how to build things. They knew how to fix things. You have an economic depression today of that same magnitude. You can have people starving to death left, right and centre. Nobody can take care of themselves. Well, they'd have to learn quick. Um, My mum said that uh, the only reason they survived the depression in Winnipeg was... um, the neighbors fed each other out of their own gardens. They baked for each other. They had to rely on each other. There was nobody else to do it. And that's why, you know, in, in crises, I think that real change happens when societies fall apart. And in times of crisis, people have to change. I know in our own individual life, it's true. When we've had a lot of stuff taken from us, we have to get stronger. You know, like I had to when I got blackballed and prevented from working and lost my family. For my own children, I, I couldn't collapse. I had to stay strong for them. And, and that's what we learned to do. So I don't think, again, we should fear adversity and loss. I think it's one of the things that helps us find ourselves again. Well, you don't know what kind of strength you have until your strength has been tested. Just yeah. like you don't know how much uh, weight a bridge can take until you've tested that steel. Mm-hmm. Now, it's the same thing with, uh, with people. They get, they get tempered, you know? Like iron, it keeps getting applied great heat again and again and again, unrelenting heat. And eventually, Mm -hmm. that little bit of iron turns into steel, right? So I think it's the trials and tribulations that people go through that they should uh, rejoice, you know? Finally, here's an opportunity to grow through this pain. Here's an opportunity to find out what my new limits are. Because uh, you don't know what your limits are unless you test them. And keep testing them. Well, especially, too, if you've, you've gone through loss for the sake of other people and those who can't fight for themselves. I mean, there's a, there's a certain righteous quality to that. And I find, I mean, I, I often tell people this story about how when I was down and out and I was living out of my car in Vancouver, I spent my days not worrying about myself. I, I spent it working with the native people, documenting their stories. And the more I focused on other people's problems, the less I had to worry about on my own. But I had five bucks left once and I met a homeless family in Vancouver and I gave it to them because they needed it more than me. I'm walking down the street and in the next block there's a $10 bill lying on the sidewalk, right? And, and the universe does that to us. It helps us. It keeps us going. I mean, I've had no no sustained income for 20 years, but the community's kept me going and the work I'm doing because it's the right thing to do. And we're held up by each other that way, but we have to take the plunge first, right? Well, so maybe we're actually, uh, we are making a, a, ne- a neo-traditional society as we speak, like the, the, the way that we actually can act globally, right? Think locally, but act globally um, is through the internet, Okay. So if you understand that there's a church in every town and uh, pedophiles and human traffickers and things of that nature, and that it's a globalized syndicate and it's not operating in isolation, think about your locale. Think about what's being done there. And then think about supporting the people who are exposing the root of that tree. 
Yeah. And in yep. such a way, we're, we're able to bring the community together, a community of scale to support individuals who otherwise, in another time, with different technology, would have died long ago. Yeah. Well, and every, we all need to do that where we live. Um, my co-host on my, I have a Sunday radio show, Radio Free Canada, and uh, my co-host Ryan Gable from America, um, he regularly goes into local Catholic churches and hands them our material showing how the Vatican is a criminal body, it traffics children, it launders money for the mafia. If you put money in the collection plate, you're, you're guilty of a crime. You're funding a transnational criminal organization and you can be convicted for it. And he's turned people away from the Catholic Church who said, gee, I didn't know this, thanks for the information. And that has a great shock effect. I mean, when we started occupying churches in Canada, it led directly to the Canadian government issuing that apology, literally in a matter of months, um, because we were hitting them where it hurt. And they're very vulnerable, these so-called big institutions, their image and their money is very vulnerable. And so people have more power than they realize if they just, you know, get off their ass and get in there and and create those local shock waves, it has a much bigger effect. It's like a tsunami, right? It builds. Well, and, and it's just the uh, the old adage, just don't do nothing about it. Okay, so many people just pass it off and they go, ah, somebody's got it handled. And a lot of the time it's like, man, somebody should do something about this. It's supposed to be you, the yeah. person who thought that somebody had to do something. Okay? Mm -hmm. that's the hardest realization i had to come to when it came to like creating alternative media for new zealand because there just there just wasn't any there wasn't any that didn't you know buy into that false fake left versus right argument or authority versus this that or the other ah just just give me something real you know that's what I wanted. I wanted some real media. I wanted some real people talking about real things. Because the problem is, we've got form over substance. You've got million dollar studios. You've got really expensive wardrobes. Incredibly pricey display systems and green screens and tech boards and all of that kind of stuff. And you know what they managed to produce with it? A huge steaming pile of bullshit. That isn't even worth the television that's broadcasted on. Yep. Now, when people wake up to that reality and they start searching for alternatives, that's when they find shows like this. That's the problem, though, isn't it? Is that it's not waking people up who aren't already searching for the truth. I think uh, there are many roads to the uh, top of the mountain of figuring out what's going on with who you are and where you sit in the universe many ways and usually it's just uh, again and I hate to beat this drum constantly you've got to suffer you know it's the mm -hmm. only thing that can, that can teach you a hard enough lesson that you will never forget it comes, it comes with doing these things and we shouldn't shun it we should expect that suffering and go through it. You know, there's that old saying, um, pain is your greatest teacher once you've made it your ally and it's not your enemy, right? You learn from your pain and your suffering and not fear it and run from it. And, um, you know, it's like information is not the end, it's the beginning. We, we, we shouldn't listen to shows like this and then say, oh, I'm satisfied now, I know more stuff. No, I should be spurred to now act based on what we know. And that's where I, I get frustrated with people when they just sit there passively and receive and don't do anything with it. Now, it's, it's the activation thing. I remember for a year, maybe maybe two years, 18 months, something around there, I was obsessed with the truth, you know? Listen to several hours of uh, alternative talk radio a day, maybe watching a couple of documentaries every day, mm -hmm. filling my head full of this stuff. But it took that long a period of time of learning at such a geometric rate that it started to drive me crazy and uh, the realization came that I'm being driven crazy because I'm learning all this stuff and not doing anything about it. And once I take control, once I start contributing, once I start getting involved, once I stop sitting on the sidelines, my insanity will go away. And it did. Yeah. 
stopped working for other people and started mm-hmm. working with other people. Mm-hmm. Now, the inherent uh, vice here is uh, the love for authority. Okay, now I don't see if you've seen the Avengers movie, and he says it's the secret unspoken truth of humanity that you crave subjugation, that you were made to be ruled. Are we, were we bred in a test tube by aliens, as some, as some people say, to just be slaves, easily controlled? And even when people are slaves, even when they are s- supposedly easily controlled, they can be called into action. They can revolt, can't they? There's plenty of historical evidence of that. Yeah, it's kind of like there, there's slavery, like anything, is a spectrum of, of um, just because people acquiesce to a system doesn't mean they, they support it. Um, and I don't think we were, we, we were genetically altered to just be slaves. I mean, that, that, that doesn't make sense when you look at the continual example of people revolting all the time. And it, it's more like, um, you know, um, we are born quite opposite with, with the other, the other uh, impulse, which is to be free all the time. And you see that in children all the time. But fear turns them into that kind of, I wouldn't even call it slavery, you know, that's too sweeping a term. It's this dependency, it's this vicarious way of the existing. The word is domesticated. Domesticated, yeah, that works. Once we're domesticated, it was so much easier to control, you know? You mentioned what would happen if you tried to get, like, wild cattle or bison or something like that in through the cattle stocks into, try, into, a, into a slaughterhouse. It would be a freaking nightmare. <laughs> they resist you every, se- every single uh, second of the way. But Yeah, well, it's like these when you're watching on the History Channel or anything, the, uh, these, these fat academics talking about, well, Boudicca's revolt against the Romans in Britain in 51 AD. I mean... What the hell do these fat slobs know about revolting and picking up a sword? I mean, the, it's like getting this domesticated sheep to talk about what lions are like. And it's, it, it's, it's the same thing, right? Well, it'd be interesting if somebody was like um, a, a member of the ultimate fighting competition or something like that who decided to do a, uh, a television show about a gladiatorial combat in ancient Rome or something like that, like from the perspective of an actual fighter. Mm-hmm. Right. That'd actually be quite a popular show, wouldn't it? Well, it would be interesting. (laughs) Man, you can sell people anything this day. Is there blood? Is there violence? Is there death? Yeah? Well, mate, here's here's $20 million. Go off and make us a TV series, mate. Yeah? I mean, people are so easy uh, to sell crap to. And that's, that's what I found as a salesman is that once you know the techniques of how to manipulate people and, and, and things like that, it's so easy to get them to make the choices that you want. And um, that power kind of scared the hell out of me because I know the kind of person that I am, that if I've got like some kind of objective or I've got some kind of like monetary reward on the, on the other side of that, I'll, I'll rule in my own self-interest, right? And I didn't actually trust myself with uh, having conversations with people specifically on the pretense of getting money out of them. And, and to this day... I actually have a phobia about calling people to ask them for money or to uh, do any kind of business call, that kind of thing. Because mm-hmm. I fully reject the idea of manipulating people purposely for personal gain. You know? Mm-hmm. Good. That's, that's inherently bad, isn't it? Yeah. And maybe we've all been tempted because there's a hell of a lot of rewards in it. That's the other thing, bro. My last paycheck was like five grand cash and like 12 grand of shopping vouchers as a bonus. You know, that was a month's work. You know? Had I kept going at that level, I could be a millionaire right by now. But I wasn't doing anything meaningful. Mm -hmm. Most people aren't doing anything meaningful, but they take the payoff, don't they? They're being bribed. They're being bribed out of fulfilling their own destiny. That's why I think suicide is the third highest cause of death in the world now, because the real crisis is 
coming from the fact that life has lost its meaning for more and more people in the technocratic culture. So, I mean, what, what can you expect, right? So, what do you do in a society when life has no freaking meaning? Okay? It's like, how do you carve out a meaningful existence out of a, a field of meaninglessness? Well, you have to step outside it to do it and step outside yourself, which is a hard thing to do, I know. But um, we're, you know, we're born with these innate um, um, gifts, right? I mean, okay, take something as simple as the sense of awe. You look up at the night sky, you see, you know, Walt Whitman, the poet, right? In the American not, poet. Not personally. In the, he lived in the 19th century. He said... That's um, why. Well, probably why, yeah. Uh, he talked about the miracles every day all around us. He said, um, you know... That just we don't have to look as far as a blade of grass to see a miracle and see meaning in our life, but we've just been desensitized. Part of the domestication process is you become dull and numb. You're not really awake. You're not even alive. And um, I like the description of people as being dead souls trying to come alive. Right? We are carrying around dead souls, but they can come alive. And often, what brings them alive more often than not is suffering. It's not affirmation that causes that it's like a bug coming out of a chrysalis or something like that you know uh it must be incredibly painful to turn from a caterpillar into a butterfly in such a tiny confined space you know yeah well i um i've never been one i don't think I mean, just think oh, here about it, is. it. Your entire your entire skeleton rearranging, everything growing growing new skin, uh, contorting, being cramped, pent up. You know, I'm six foot four. I know what growing pains are all about. You know, mm. and again, I wouldn't be taller without those growing pains, would I? It's, a, it's the same kind of thing. Um, but I feel that we're we're kind of uh, going over this exact same territory repeatedly, aren't we? Now, is it an effort to awaken people as to what's actually inside them? What they can release if they just let go of these little trinkets and in the, these things? I keep um, oh. catching myself um, looking down on people who have jobs. You know? I know that uh, life is hard and I know that people have kids to feed and and things like that and i know a hell of a lot of people actually really do enjoy their jobs get f full-on enjoyment and fulfillment out of them I'm not talking about that mm -hmm. i'm talking again about the meaninglessness of life what meaning do you derive from your life uh making big macs pumping gas doing these menial tasks which you know either people can do for themselves or a, or a robot can do you know? Well, the point is, even somebody in those meaningless jobs has some aspect of their life where they do search meaning for meaning. That's why I found as a minister why people came to church. It wasn't just the social club element. It wasn't just to feel self-righteous or to look good in front of others. I mean, that was all there, but they were looking for um, to be immersed in something greater than themselves, some higher principle, some higher purpose. They were hungry, right? And Unfortunately, most clergy don't even know that in themselves, so they can't give it to their people. But, you know, when I, when I began to talk more about my own life and my own struggles and that, I found people around me began to open up, right? They need to see that first embodied in somebody. Sort of like how uh, somebody might stand up and protest or something like that in a, uh, in a theater full of people, and then another person stands up by, yeah. behind them and another and another... Being an example, know. being an yeah. example um, means two things. Number one, your enemies can see you, but number two, those who are your allies who are unaware that there was anybody like them around see you as well and stand up behind you. You never know the impact you're going to have. I remember for years, I carried the image of a guy I met when I was just 21. I was unemployed in Hamilton in Canada. And he was just an old guy. He was in his 80s. His name was Don Epperson. He used to pick at City Hall all by himself. And it didn't even matter what the issue was. He was always out there, rain or shine, doing his little one-man protest. And he always, he inspired me. Like, fifth, you know, 40 years later, I'm still inspired by the image of that old guy who had more determination than people a third, you know, 
in my age and he just never gave up and um i've always th so he didn't know the impact he was having on me just by doing that right well, I, I've talked about this again on the sh on the show this week, and it's amazing how things uh, keep coming full circle like this. It's a ripple effect. I just had my YouTube channel deleted. My life's work, eight years, 3,000 videos, oh. 5 million views, 20, 20, 23,000 mm -hmm. subscribers, just all gone, right? And um, mm -hmm. I was on the Bob Tuscan show, and he asked me, what's the, what's the point in us even doing this if everything we've done will just disappear? And I said, well kind of look at it like this there's a lot of people who are alive today because of those videos you know just yeah. because i did them they're already yes. alive and they're not going to die um there are people who are inspired there are people who started their own radio shows there are people who were depressed and about to give up on truth and activism and doing the right thing all together and just go back into the workforce and, be and become uh, an unwilling slave and, yep. they, and, they, and they didn't, you know. So it doesn't matter that you don't get the, the kudos. It doesn't matter if your life's work is, you know, oh. yours and you own it. It's kind of like a film. Once it gets released into the public sphere, it doesn't belong to you anymore. It becomes a part of people's culture. It becomes a part of their heritage. That's right. Yeah, I get that all the time from people. And, uh, you know... You plant the seed and it'll grow. That's all you have to be concerned about. And that's why I laugh at all these people who go, Oh, why are you discussing this particular subject with this particular guest? Don't you know that there's all these other topics and guests, etc., etc., that you could be doing? Really, bro? You mean all those topics and guests that you're not doing the interviews on? And uh, not uploading the videos y yourself? Or do doing anything productive whatsoever? Well, that's what I always say. Yeah, that's what I always say to my uh, vociferous critics. They say, "Okay, fine. If you don't think I did it right, then you do it better." Did I'm you say watching. the? Did you say the vociferous uh, critics, or was Vocif that a Freudian? <laughs> vociferous. Those 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 ra rabid critics that are you know they come after anybody who's prominent. You know, I mean, just the trolls. You know, not trolls, but um, I say, fine, do it better. You know, the world is watching. I only love two things in this world. One is my wife, and the other is the block function on social media. Thank you. You're purged and gone forever. <laughs> so good. You know, kind of like uh, when you stretch and, you, and your back cracks like really, really good, and you're like, oh, <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> Maybe... Uh -huh. Maybe I'm taking it a little bit overboard. Sorry about that. No, it's yeah. fine. Yeah. However, uh, back to the Vatican. I want to. I want to know how rich exactly are these people? You know, who's actually holding the the keys? Is there? I mean, I know that there's a hierarchical structure and things like that. But however, there's a public face of a hierarchical structure, and then there is the shadow structure underneath, which actually really pulls the strings. For example, in the New Zealand government, you get to elect new parliamentarians every year, but the shadow controllers are treasury and all of the bureaucracy whose jobs do not change from election to election. They truly run the country. That's who the um, who comes in and tells the Prime Minister, well, you know, all these promises you have about giving all these benefits to people and not selling the country to foreign interests, that's just not going to work, bro. <sighs> so you're going to have to break all those promises and you're going to have to make up some bullshit story. Uh, otherwise, yeah, we're not going to give you any more money and uh, the public's going to basically try and lynch you in the street. Okay, Mr. Prime Minister, welcome to your first day on the job. Yeah, well, I mean, in terms of the Vatican, they're the richest corporation on the planet. They Just from the collection plate alone, that's, you know, uh, average 15 to 25 billion a year just from the collection plate. You add into that the, the uh, financial concordats, which are secret treaties with governments, over 100 governments in the world, where taxpayers' money is funded directly to the Vatican Bank. You've got all their massive investment portfolio, all the corporations, the arms industry, the Monsanto, GMO corporations are invested in. You add it all up, um, they're, you know, clearly, they're, they're, 
they're taking a lot of that money and they're putting it into the BRICS bank with the Russian and the Chinese investment. They're one of the biggest financial players in the world. I mean, it's it's mind-boggling the wealth there, and it's that's why it's hilarious when the latest pseudo pope Jorge Bergoglio is walking around the world pretending he's this poor humble guy like Saint Francis. I mean. You know, that's like saying the head of the mob um, is really a nice guy. He donates to charity, right? <laughs> Robin Williams movie uh, called My Man of the Year. And he said, you know, we should have, we should have a Brazilian Pope next. You know, Pope Raul. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it'd be great. And, and, and it'd, be, it'd be great. He'd have uh, a whole bunch of cha-cha ladies with him, you know, with the twirly things on the nibble. <laughs> right. You know, just to be really Pope-like. You know, special access to the Pope Scope area. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry. I usually do this to, towards the end of the broadcast. I imagine uh, I run out of steam and I get tired and I just start acting a little bit silly. Um, you know. It's all right. We need more of that in the world. I enjoy it. <laughs> you know, I, ca- yeah. I can't lie. I do crack me up. Yeah. Okay. As long as you're happy. Yeah, 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 yeah. So the Vatican's actually the richest corporation in the entire world. Um, well, they're in, they're integrated into all the big banks. They're it, it's like they're they're it's they're one of the biggest players in the global you know this gl- global corporatocracy they're setting up, and um, well, they're, they're trying both- to create one one world religion, one world government. I mean, it's part of the whole agenda. Okay. Okay. So the United States, uh, Washington, D.C. is the military arm of this trifecta of, of world dominance. That'll try to, you know, militarily enforce government, you know, world government. It'll have a world army. And the second part is London. They'll have the world economy in stack. So once you've controlled everybody militarily and financially, then you need to control them spiritually. And that's where the Vatican... Uh, comes in with military money and religion they plan to dominate the entire planet for the benefit of a very very small narrow elite who are inbred crazy psychopathic and uh, extremely dangerous the most dangerous people that have ever lived are the people that are living today, I think. Because they can kill so many without even getting a drop of blood on their hands. Yeah, because we allow them to. <laughs> we allow them to. You are trying to stop them. Could you stop them all of a sudden? You couldn't. It's not because you're allowing them to. Is that they're too powerful for just you. No, I meant collectively. All we have to do, and it doesn't even take a majority of us, if we just stop helping them, stop paying their taxes, stop voting for them, stop buying their shitty products, stop looking to them all the time, just ignore them, turn away from them, take back your power, your land, your children, your, your neighborhood, pull your money out of banks. I mean... Take it all back. They will fall. They're nothing. They're like the little man in Wizard of Oz, the little guy behind the big mask, right? And uh, we got to say to the soldiers and the police, stop working for them. You know? It's, well, it's that simple. Except they've got thermonuclear weapons and a globalized police state and, uh, you know, uh, hellfire missiles that can be fired from a drone at uh, any U.S. citizen worldwide and stuff like They're that. They're not firing them. Yeah. The elites aren't firing them. Well, <laughs> not yet. <sighs> no, I mean, I, they're not the ones doing it. They're just the parasites. They are the parasites. But the problem is there's so many people, especially uh, people in positions where they can kill, you know, or give orders to kill and th- things of that nature, who buy into the authority so massively, don't they? That That they will follow those orders i mean this this is what the 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 whole programming uh, in my opinion is about to rob somebody of their common humanity their common humanity that would stop them from following an order that they knew was wrong yeah but i see a lot of people disobeying orders all the time 
mm -hmm. I see in the eyes of cops who know they're they're doing something wrong, but they don't know what to do. They're they're confused about who to serve and what to do. It's not so monolithic that everybody's just serving them. It's I think the system is shaking and tottering right now, frankly, and it'll come down. But we have to keep. It's where we put our energy. Is it uh, kind of voicing our our angst against these people and their illusions, or stepping out of the illusion? That's it, we are living in an illusion, this bubble world in our head that somehow we are subject to them, right? We have to just wake up. People give the new world order too much credit. There's I guess no so, such thing. I guess There's so. no such thing as the United States government. There's no such thing as the Vatican. These are corporate. These are ideas. They're just people. <laughs> yeah, they're just a bunch of guys. My my uh, partner Carol. We were at a protest once, and she went up to a cop, and he was arguing with us that we couldn't protest at this church. And he finally said to her, don't you know who I am? And Carol just said to him, you're just a guy in a blue suit. <laughs> and he did kind of a double take. And he kind of walked away. You could see he was confused because he was thinking, yeah, I guess I'm just a guy in a suit. <laughs> That's why I wear suits to protests. I call it urban camouflage. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you blend right in. Um, and also, when was the last time you saw a protester wearing a suit getting beaten up by the cops or arrested during a protest? Mm -hmm. Never. Alright? I got deeply traumatized by being arrested, and I plan to not do it again. Hence, I wear urban camouflage. I wear a collar around my neck, and cuffs around my wrists, and a tie like a leash, mm -hmm. hanging, hanging out in front of me. I look just like a slave. Yeah, people don't even realize that that's how comprehensive the slavery is. And, and it's funny, in this last week, uh, in this last month, maybe because I lost my YouTube channel, it's been forcing me to come to these realizations. I've realized that I'm really badly brainwashed. I've got a whole bunch of habits and everything that have been instilled from me by sources I'm only just now realizing exist. I'm having thoughts about what I'm turning into because of this brainwashing and what I need to stop, like how much of my life I need to stop living. You know? Brainwashing is so addictive that it becomes a part of your life, it becomes a part of your lifestyle, and you cling onto it as if it's the only way to live. Right? That's what's been hitting me lately. Even now. You know, even though I've stopped working for uh, globalist corporations, even though I've started up uh, alternative media and, and helped a whole bunch of people get the word out and activism and that, that kind of thing, even then, I'm still brainwashed and doing a whole bunch of things that are programmed in me from sources I didn't even know had that influence. Mm. Right? Now, if somebody can get to, like, my level at this point, and then only just be discovering that. I think everybody needs to be, you know, really cognizant of, of that fact and kind of ask yourself on a routine basis, am I currently brainwashed in some way? You know, how do you know if you're under mind control? If you've never questioned whether or not you're under mind control, that's how. I'm well, of course, the whole thing the whole thing could be and is coming down anyway, so in a way, it's all moot. It's a moot point because when it comes crashing down, then we'll know one way or the other, right? Will it? You know, I, I have that, maybe. you know, maybe a, perhaps the word is hope that that's what's going to happen, but I sometimes I can't see it. I really just can't see it, Kevin. I can't see a a bloodless... Uh, oh, into this, it won't be bloodless by any means. It never is, but uh, it's not bloodless now. It's there's slaughter going on as we speak. It's just that we don't see it, you know. But um, it's not going to be on some distant battlefield. It'll be like uh, you know, it'll be, in, it'll be in every one of our neighborhoods. Yeah, kids will see it. Uh -huh. You know, you won't be able to just keep it from them when you come back from the from the battlefront or whatever. 
just to spare them the pain of, of hearing about it. Can you imagine an entire generation be like so badly traumatized by actually fighting a war amongst ourselves to actually free the human race from these tyrannical, par parasitical scumbaggery fucks? You know, that they might actually create another tyranny, just as bad, if not worse. Right after. I think the only, the only way around that is to recognize that the tyranny comes from each one of us, that if there's parasitic scumbags, we created it. It doesn't come from some alien imposition. It comes from each one of us. We created the situation, and so we have to withdraw from it, you know. Like, I don't have an enemy in that sense. I don't see these guys as enemies, right? What? Why not? Because they're not doing anything that you and I wouldn't do under different circumstances. I think. Really? I mean, because I think psychopaths say uh, there's only ever been a small, very small percentage of them, and they're not like us. They don't. They don't think like us. They don't feel like we do. But They've, any of us, any of us can become that, right? It's not. Um, they're not some alien species. They're just people who got turned the wrong way. It's like you know when I used to work. Um, we, we had a men's group in my church, and guys would come forward and talk about. Um, you know, all these sexual fantasies they had and all these, how they would sneak off to prostitutes and do this. And they couldn't admit it to their wife, but they could to, you know, our little group. And they're not having any desires that not any of us didn't have, but they were being more honest about it. And um, I realized after a while that that all these, what what are called sins or perversions or anything, or corruption of any kind, is really just at the core of it, it's some need for love that's been, you know, unfulfilled. And it's so true with people who are in power. Like, I've known some of these people, um, you know, these elites, now and then, through being a minister and just coming across them. And, and they are dead souls. They don't see anything wrong with what they're doing, but they're not there. They're, like, possessed by something. So I realized, well, the enemy isn't flesh and blood. It's the spirit of possession, right? And that's what we have to fight. It's a spiritual battle. And it starts in our own heart, you know. End of sermon. <laughs> well, the war rages on inside each and every one of us, bubbling away yep. with little explosions and things like that, and cries and screams and, ex <laughs> you know. Yep. I think maybe that's uh, that's how you know you're still alive. That's how you know you're not dead yet. I mean, yep. life in itself is defined by the struggles we go through, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Very much. I mean, uh, you don't even find... In fact, you can't find meaning to your life without struggle, can you? You know? No, you can't. You can't. You don't know what you're fighting for unless you, f unless you figure out something that you're fighting against. You know? Mm. And unless you see some, some wrong that needs to be righted that nobody else is doing, you'll never have the compulsion. Yeah. You know? I think um, we've been taken care of, and it's just been it's just been too easy uh, to sit back, be blasé, get distracted, and um, it's been so easy that people have done it for their whole life, and they're, they're now only just coming to the end of their lives and realizing that they they wasted the first forty to fifty years of it. That's a horrible feeling. Yeah, I turned sixty in February, and I'm I'm kind of I'm happy with my life because I've always lived according to what I thought was right, and I tried to do something about it all the time. And uh, I wasn't successful a lot of the time, but at least I tried. I didn't stop, right? But most people aren't in that boat, and um, they, they regret their life. They regret all the compromises and, and losses. That, how they betrayed themselves, first of all. That's the worst feeling. I think uh, also when it comes to compromise, a good relationship involves uh, communication and uh, compromise and cooperation, right? A bad relationship, there's only compromise. Kind of like with, a, uh, with an employer. He doesn't really need a, a whole bunch of communication, doesn't really need a whole bunch of cooperation, just needs your complete and total compliance. That's the corporate model, yep. To hell with the corporate model, man. I mean, yep. it I sucks. Say. 
I mean, and, I mean, I, I'm meeting people who are actually they they enjoy their job and stuff. They they, they like their boss, and it, it's just ooh, it actually makes me throw up in my mouth a little, bro. You know, mm-hmm. it's just disgusting. It's yeah. it, it, it's it's like debasing yourself uh, for money. Yeah. Well. You could have more respect as a homeless person with a sign that says, "Will debase self for money." <laughs> <laughs> oh, maybe not respect right. for the general community, but at least more self-respect. Okay. Now, sorry about that. Again, kind of starts to lose it towards the end of the shows these days. I don't know why that is. Run out of things to think about. We're going, we're going over the same territory again and again and again. And this effort to make it sink in to people, uh, hopefully, repetition well, being a, a form of mind control is not a bad thing if you're repeating a message that enables people to empower themselves. Right. Cattle being a catalyst and an inspiration is more important than filling in with information, I think. But, yeah. Don't yeah. be cattle. Be a catalyst. That's right. There you go. <laughs> otherwise we're all going to go into the slaughterhouse aren't we okay Kevin uh, final minutes of the show here I'd love uh, for you to plug your website services books etc uh, sure. so that you can get a little bit more uh, support financing etc for your uh, your endeavours thanks Benny uh, well our tribunal website the tribunal into crimes of church and state is itccs.org uh, KevinAnna.com, personal website. And um, I do a radio show every Sunday, uh, 6 p.m. Eastern Time, bbsradio.com slash Radio Free Canada, K A N A T A. And um, yeah, tune in and um, follow the work, especially at itccs.org. That's where you have a lot of the updates. That, uh, are all and right there. And thanks updating- for the time. I appreciate it. You updating regularly like during the during every day or Pardon me? Are you updating the website regularly, like every day? Every few days it, it gets more stuff put on there. Um different campaigns going on in Europe and North America. Active much and on that, Facebook yeah. at all? No, you know what? Every time I try to open a thing on Facebook it gets taken down. I'm just permanently banned from there, so Ah Bastards. Yeah, well, so I don't worry about that. I just word of mouth is the best way. I saw a, a Kevin Annett on uh, on Facebook. I sent it a message. It has a uh, the picture of your book on it with that uh, that child that has the uh, the growths all over her yeah. skin. I c- yeah, but I can't access it. I can't get onto Facebook at all. It won't let me on, no matter where I do it from. So that's really weird, bro. Doing something right. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, that is the old saying, isn't it? If you're copying mm-hmm. the flag, it means you're over the target. Right. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you very much, uh, Kevin, and uh, thank you very much. Thanks, man. Well, you know, it's it's just been a pleasure having you on, bro, because uh, yeah. you've been through probably a bit more suffering than I have in my time, and I usually kind of enjoy talking to people who've had it rougher than me because it teaches me to harden the fuck up sometimes, you know? Right. Well, I appreciate the time. We'll do it again sometime. Yeah, cheers, brother. Okay. All right. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for listening. This is the Vinny Eastwood Show on AmericanFreedomRadio.com. Tune in every single day. You never know who we're going to have on. It's a pick and mix, all sorts type of show. No taboo topics. This is american freedom radio that you're listening to which is a listener supported network by the way please ladies and gentlemen do me a favor do yourself a favor do them a favor do humanity a favor and go to americanfreedomradio.com today and make a little donation start up a monthly one if you can keep financing the things that you want to see more of and they will grow and they will take over the bad things that you want to see less of We'll see you again sometime, folks, at the Vinnie Eastwood Show dot com.